this is sort of coming back to the idea of what we call the biological species concept, which basically states that if two uh, individuals can interbreed, they are a species. But unfortunately, that's rather limiting because it basically lumps, say, for example, timber wolves and chihuahuas into the same species um, because, you know, they, they can, with probably a bit of assistance, uh, interbreed. That isn't the whole story, however, because it's not just the genetic signature. It's also the, the morphology, so the, the shape of the animal, its skull, its, its internal organ structure. It's also its behavioral components. It's how it interacts with other members of its pack. It's also how dependent it is on humans or not, and, as well as its, uh, its food sources and a whole raft of different ecological components that differentiate it from other other uh, species within the same genus. So they're all dogs in the sense that they're all canids. So uh, Ethiopian wolves and timber wolves and coyotes and, and dingoes and domestic dogs, they're, they're all in the same genus, but they all are separate species. So what evidence is there that the dingo has specific characteristics that are different to say dogs or wolves? Well, one, one of the main things is just the uh, the type of pack structure um, and also its uh, communications between individuals within a pack as well as its ability as I said earlier to be able to live independently and entirely separately from human interaction or intervention so uh, while dogs can to a certain extent live semi-independently but there is always usually a connection to some sort of human food source whether that's passive or uh, more active intervention from humans. Dingoes are quite capable of living in a, in a normal pack structure um, and completely entirely on their own. Now, some uh, dingoes across certain states are protected, others aren't. What are the ramifications of classifying uh, the dingo as, as protected? Huge. <laughs> well, we, we invest millions and millions of dollars every year in maintaining the dingo fence, which basically tries to keep dingoes out of the southern part of Australia where most of the pastoralism is. Um, but it's also, uh, we've, we've shown quite clearly that where dingoes are allowed to be dingoes and not persecuted through poisoning and shooting, that they suppress uh, other feral species, for example, cats and dogs, which have huge impacts on our, our native marsupials. In fact, Australia is leading the world in mammal extinctions. What about for farmers who see the, the dingoes as pests? Well, in, in some ways, it, you can actually get a counterintuitive outcome. We've done some work uh, in semi-arid lands of eastern Australia for cattle uh, pastoralism. And in fact, when you allow dingoes to be dingoes, they tend to reduce the densities of kangaroos, which are their preferred prey, which actually releases a lot of grazing pressure, pressure so that you basically get more food for cows and higher growth rates and more profit per hectare. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply to all parts of Australia or to all types of pastoralism, but it does show that you can actually get a more ecologically balanced system. So it's not just, you know, it's good for the small mammals that unfortunately most people don't probably care about, but it can actually lead to better landscape management. And let's face it, it's, um, we really have a problem with managing the entirety of the, you know, the outback in, in the sense that we can't, you know, kill all the cats and we can't remove all the foxes. And we we now hearing complaints from much of the agricultural industry about being too many kangaroos and we have to call the kangaroos. Well, why don't we use our natural predators to do the job for us? Do you expect that this research could have any bearing on reforms to the WA Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is expected, I believe, sometime this year, uh, the idea that it won't consider a change to its existing classification of the dingo as a wild dog, which means landowners could kill without a licence? Well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where they are in the negotiations and, and really what their final decision will be, but I was under the impression that the... Um, the submission that we made, um, there were several people, including some of the world, uh, the this country's top ecologists and dingo experts, that uh, that submission was being considered as a, a strong argument against the delisting. So I, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's actually going to go through, but again, I could be wrong. Sure. So finally, uh, Corey Bradshaw, why do you think the classification of the dingo is such a contentious issue? Well, I, it's 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 uh, it's a long, I think, long running part of being human. The uh, the idea that we are competing with predators, and I mean, you think about African farmers that have to deal with things like lions taking out their their cattle. 
this this human wildlife conflict is deeply ingrained in us, and it's part of our development pathway that we've pushed nature back farther and farther. And anything that even remotely threatens us or our livelihoods can be seen as a menace that must be eradicated. Now, I think, you know, hopefully humanity has matured a little bit more than that, but we still have this legacy of this human wildlife conflict and we should control it. When in fact, we have the ability to use ecology to our benefit as well, and we can have a healthy environment and prosperity simultaneously. Professor Corey Bradshaw from Flinders University, great to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much.